So we uh, we defined for a bosonic system of diagonal long range order as a property of the single particle density matrix, and we looked at bosons that have a single eigenvalue, which is has an is extensive and has an eigenfunction um, uh, that comes along with this. And uh, if we have an, an an implication of this very large extensive eigenvalue is that even at large distances. Uh, you find correlations between uh, basically eliminating and adding a boson in the system in basically what will be such a bose condensate. And we looked at charged bosons mostly as a finger play to, to exercise our thoughts. We looked at this specific model and I emphasize everything we said is uh, valid for arbitrarily strong correlations. You cannot say everything, but you can say some things rigorously. Um, we uh, exploited the fact that a homogeneous field can be uh, has is translation invariant uh, for the system or doesn't destroy translation variants, and hence uh, can be formulated as a translations can be formulated as gauge transformations, and this alone uh, gave us a condition for the translational behavior of this density matrix. This doesn't help us at all. Um, really, there's not much you can learn from this, but if you do have off-diagonal long-range order, um, as defined uh, just a second ago, then we have a, a relationship that is valid only for the leading eigenfunction, because we can always take these two positions at large distances and can still exploit this identity. Now, there was a question at the end, how we went from here, from this equation, which I, I hope you can see, um, to, uh, you can, I hope you can see my mouse, that's what I mean. Um, uh, we go from this equation to the one in the orange box here, which because now we go from a two particle, if you want so, or two point function to a single point function. Um, I will, uh, uh, I just briefly summarize the step from here to here uh, in what follows. So this is here. Um, so let's, this is one more time the equation we had, and uh, I was my brain wasn't quick enough uh, when I got the question yesterday to answer it properly. So if since this is valid only for one function, what you do is you divide uh, the the equation by this wave function here and by everything that depends on r only. So I put every dependency on r on the left hand side, and uh, I and every dependency is on r prime on the right hand side. So therefore this this combination of object depend, uh, is not depend on R prime. Um, it may depend on R, but it's independent on R prime. On the other hand, this combination depends on R prime, but is independent on R. So therefore, as there's an equal sign, this cannot depend on R. Therefore, it's some function. Then you observe that this object here, just with a different argument, is just a complex conjugate and the inverse of this object. So therefore, this must be a phase factor. And that concludes the proof uh, that we uh, hence could uh, deduce that we really can uh, make this conclusion for the single valued function. And you see immediately, if this was a sum of many terms on both sides here, we couldn't do this. We couldn't just divide by, say, the R prime dependencies or the R dependencies. That's why this works, because we are condensed in one state. From there, we then did multiple translations uh, around different paths, uh, covering basically some area. And we found um, pure gauge principles with a bit of algebra tells us that the magnetic field for a translation invariant system should always be zero. So therefore, the Meissner effect is not a consequence of some technical calculation of some perturbative analysis. It is always true when we have such a condensate. Now, uh, this is what we did in the last lecture, and I actually want to finish my, my reasoning by looking at fermions. Of course, that's what we are really interested in the context of superconductivity. Now, everything is conceptually very much the same. It is just a lot more indices to carry along. So for fermions, clearly a single particle density matrix would not work because the occupation of any state is always bound to be smaller than one and hence can never be extensive. But it's more interesting to look at two particle densities. And here we know in the BCS theory is an example for this, that um, there can be such condensation. But for the time being, we just assume it to exist. 
So now we have a density matrix between uh, two fermions that are being created and two fermions are annihilated at corresponding lattice points and with spin indices and so forth. But as I said earlier, this arguments of, of coordinates and spins uh, is just some giant uh, combined index. And we can again look in this index space for eigenfunctions of this matrix. Uh, and the eigenfunctions, as hard as they might be to come by, they certainly exist, the operators Hermitian and so forth. And it, therefore, we can always expand the object in its own eigenfunctions. And the concept of off-diagonal long-range order is now just the same as what we have seen before, namely that one of those eigenvalues is just extensive. And then at large distances, and we have to define precisely because we have so many coordinates, uh, what we mean by large distances. At large distances, this will then decouple. So what do we mean by large distances? The points where we create should be far away from the points where we annihilate. So therefore, the unprimed variable can be close to one another, and the primed variable can be close to one another, but they individually have to be far away from one another, which means I'm creating a pair here and, and annihilating a pair here. They can be even on identical lattices, which is what we usually have in S-wave cases, near next nearest neighbor lattices, which lattice points, which we have often in D-wave lattices, but they can also be a little bit further away. Important is, I'm creating and annihilating the pair uh, very, very distant from one another. And then I have, once again, such a dominating eigenvalue. This object here behaves precisely from the, the exchange under coordinates that we know from annihilation or creation operators, say these are anti-commuting variables, behaves just like an anti-symmetric two-particle wave function. It is to some extent the natural Cooper pair wave function, but we don't need to know a thing about Cooper pairs in the, in the narrow sense or of a Cooper instability in the, in the narrow sense. This is always true. So we have this um, expansion of the density matrix in terms of a leading eigenvalue, and now we do the exact same logic. We perform translations. They can be formed as gauge transformations. We know how uh, the tr gauge transformation would look like. It's actually completely identical because uh, to the bosonic case. It's, we just were discussing properties of the vector potential. And we can then uh, change the gauge in our fermionic operators, which gives us a property that by which the density matrix transforms, and which then by the exact same logic that we've just exploited tells us how the wave function transforms if there is off-diagonal long-range order. The only difference is that now each of these two coordinates gets its own gauge factor by the same translation, of course, because we are translating the entire system. So the only difference really to the bosonic case is now we have twice as many coordinates here and twice as many phase factors. And uh, now we want to do the same passage going from uh, along one translation along A and another one along B, and then we change the order. We first go along B and then along A, and then it require that these two wave functions on the final and initial points are each time the same. They're single valued. Now, there will be exactly one difference in the calculation, namely that there's an additional factor two here that comes, every charge is now basically twice the charge. This comes from these two phase factors here. Otherwise, the condition is the same and the logic is the same. The logic is again that translation invariance implies that the system has no magnetic field that can penetrate that superconductor in its bulk. Uh, so we again have shown now, however, for fermions that there's a Meissner effect. And we don't need to derive the Meissner effect as is done, for example, in the BCS theory using certain coherence factors of certain BCS wave functions. This is a wonderful calculation. There's nothing wrong with this. It's correct. However, uh, what we've done here gives us the same result, yet a lot more general and with a lot less work, in fact. Uh, and I like the last part. Really, what we did here is not hard work. Just a little bit of, uh, of uh, algebra. I made my mistakes here and there yesterday, but that's just because I make my mistakes here and there. You guys are much better uh, trained in doing technical calculations. But you can also go a little bit further. 
we don't need to assume that our system has perfect translation invariance. A real superconductor lives in a crystalline lattice. A crystalline lattice has a leftover translation invariance of the underlying lattice. And therefore, if these vectors A and B would be some multiples of the lattice vectors, then I can still perform the entire calculation because still my Hamiltonian will be invariant under those translations and only the kinetic energy will be affected by the appropriate gauge transformation. So therefore, this condition here is true even in a crystal as long as A and B remain lattice vectors of the underlying crystalline lattice. So now, which magnetic fields are allowed? The, the lead, if n is zero, the index n that we have here on the right-hand side, then of course the field will still be zero. That's still a solution and it's still a possibility. If n is one, this would be the smallest way we can create an, something on the right-hand side that is finite. Then this magnetic field here uh, would have to take a value that is um, of the order um, of, um, uh, I just see this is, uh, this has to be a two, two, two minus two here. This is of the order of say one over the lattice constant squared. So, so therefore, if I have some underlying lattice constant, the smallest field is uh, essentially hc over two e and then a to the minus two, keep in mind there's a minus two missing here, right? So phi not a to the minus two, which means there is one flux quantum per atomic unit cell. So, and that's of course uh, a gigantic field, but it is in principle quantum mechanically allowed. And uh, if you try to estimate this, so a superconductor can accommodate a field if the field fits into the unit cell. I didn't say that this is the energetically most favorite one, but at least from the uh, energy, from the quantum mechanical coherence point of view, this is a permissible state. And in fact, the work, there are calculations, for example, from the solution of the the, uh, the high field behavior of conventional superconductor, where precisely those reentrant superconducting states were found at very very high fields. But if you estimate, of course, what the fields are for usual crystals, it's about a million times the fields that we can generate on Earth these days, which is of the order of, say, 10 Tesla or so, maybe 100 Tesla. So, so therefore, in ordinary crystals, uh, this seems to be something that is quite out of reach. But, uh, of course, we are all very well aware that, for example, with more ray crystals, we have, say, synthetic crystals that are superconducting. Um, which have lattice constants that are l much, much larger, and therefore the magnetic fields required to uh, put a flux quantum in one unit cell is much, much smaller, and those high field states uh, are therefore may may much less out of reach uh, if you are looking at these uh, more crystals with very, very large unit cells, such as those that occur very near um, some uh, the magic angle uh, of, of uh, twisted bilayer graphene, for example. So uh, this is all something that we got basically for almost for free from this analysis. And maybe one last uh, comment I want to make is you can. This is a calculation I did with a student just a few months ago. You can use this uh, entire approach, for example, to ask uh, whether also inhomogeneous magnetic fields can exist. So far what we have excluded were only homogeneous magnetic fields because then translation invariance would be uh, a, a good symmetry modulus maybe crystalline translations. But what we can also do of course is we can ask um, whether inhomogeneous and I've tr assumed here um, periodic magnetic fields such as of course a vortex lattice. In this case you would just expand the magnetic field in the reciprocal lattice vectors of that vortex lattice and ask whether there are any conditions on the magnetic field in the problem. And well, not a lot of calculation has to be done and then you find what you would expect, namely that if you do have such a magnetic field lattice, the unit cell flux needs to be a multiple of the flux quantum of the system. So you get a flux lattice. So 
And uh, everyone here in the room should probably say, oh my God, I'm un uh, completely unsurprised. This is of course what I would expect for this calculation to occur. But on the other hand, it is something uh, that is exactly true even if the Ginsburg-Landau theory or if the BCS theory don't apply. Um, so, and if you want to exploit systems where you where these uh, so well-established approaches really cannot be used any longer, because say you have a quantum critical material, you have an extremely strongly uh, interacting dope mod insulator, and so forth, uh, then this gives you some confidence um, in the fact that certain phenomena are much more robust than the theories which they were originally derived from. This was the main message of my first talk. I just wanted to give you a perspective that you probably haven't seen uh, much discussed in the literature of superconductivity. It makes really no sense for me to present to you the BCS theory of superconductivity. There's so brilliant books written about the topic that I felt I give you this just simply alternative perspective, um, something that might inspire you or be useful to you in the future. I will now switch gears. But this might be the right moment uh, for us to discuss, uh, if there are still open questions, the issue of off-diagonal long-range order in superconductors for bosons and fermions and the implication thereof. If there are any questions. But there is no question at this moment. Okay, very good. Good. So now I want, as I mentioned, I want to switch gear and to discuss some topics that are more recently um, relevant in uh, or in, in my own research and have attracted quite a bit of attention. Namely, what we want to look at is superconductivity near quantum critical points. Now, you have had a long discussion in those schools, and if I'm sufficiently informed, you dis did discuss already that uh, critical points give you a certain amount of, of, uh, of uh, say, often non fermi liquid behavior. I certainly saw that you had wonderful lectures on fermi liquid theory on its own right. And what I'm showing to you here are just experimental facts. The experimental facts are that in a significant number class of materials, this is cerium, uh, palladium to silicon two, this is a heavy fermion a superconductor, or here cerium indium-3, another heavy electron superconductor. What we have is a magnetic system, in fact. We suppress, in this case, via pressurizing the material, we're suppressing the magnetic transition temperature here. And uh, as the transition temperature is just about to vanish, we find that the system becomes superconducting. Something very, very similar happens also in this quite different material, serum in um 3 You have a magnetic system, you suppress magnetism, and just where the, super, the magnetism disappears, we have superconductivity at the foot of this uh, critical point. Here I'm showing you results for a quasi one dimensional organic charge transfer salt. Chemically, this couldn't be more different from these heavy electron systems. Again, we are suppressing this pressure density wave magnetic state, and where this happens and disappears at a critical point, the superconducting transition temperature uh, is not only emerging, but even largest right where this, where this magnetism disappears. And finally, this is an iron-based superconductor, uh, the so-called 1-2-2 family, with where iron is substituted by cobalt. We have a density wave magnetism. The, in this case, we are doping iron by cobalt. Um, we are suppressing uh, the, mag the, superconduct the magnetic transition temperature, and Tc is largest right where this magnetic transition temperature vanishes, and uh, some critical behavior was indeed observed uh, as function of temperature as well. So this is something that is clearly ubiquitous. Uh, we have a critical point, a, a point where we have strong fluctuations of some collective mode, magnetic mode in the examples here, but we could have other degrees of freedom. And uh, and right where superconductivity disappears, where the magnetism disappears or whatever order we have, we have a superconducting dome. Uh, we have a maximum temperature in the regime where the fluctuations are largest. And this is something that is not entirely obvious to understand. And why is this um, not entirely obvious? For this, it may make sense to remind ourselves how usually 
superconductivity occurs in a Fermi liquid. Now I'm becoming much more specialized, and uh, this is something we could have determined from, say, the BCS theory. I will just do it the following way. I say I have a Fermi liquid, which means my single particle Green's function of the problem, and I've seen you had talks on the subject, um, has a pole, um, which is a simple single pole with, with power one and some residue of this pole. Uh, and this is what goes under the name of the quasi-particle weight. And then there might be all kinds of structural background in the single particle spectrum. From the point of view of a Dyson equation or a self-energy, it means that the self-energy is linear in frequency, if I'm thinking in terms of uh, Matsubara language. And uh, this quasi-particle weight is just determined by this coefficient of this linear behavior here. So I have this, I name, I make this assumption for my Fermi liquid, which is not what I should be doing for those critical states. I'm just reminding ourselves what we would usually have. And then you sum up, have some pairing interaction, which is wiggly line. And I'm summing up those particle-particle diagrams. They're the logarithmically dominating contributions. Any of those sequence of diagrams, you always sum up through a geometric series. You have some pairing interaction in the problem. And you have some susceptibility that you would have even in the absence of pairing. So this is a property of the, say, free electron gas. And here you just need to calculate two Green's functions, the ones that are parallel here. Uh, there's an integration over momentum and frequency, which I'm writing like this. If you insert these Green's functions here, you perform the integration over frequency, momentum, first of all, energy or momentum, if you want to, so then over frequency, you find that there's a logarithm. This is the famous Cooper lock. So I'm cheating here a little bit. This is an integral. It should be a Matsubara sum. What I do is I put a lower cutoff that is temperature and an upper cutoff that is some upper cutoff that the theory ceases to be sensible. Uh, and then I'm getting a logarithm here. I insert this up here and I find a pole of the this, of this susceptibility at a temperature, which is the usual result for the BCS theory. All of this is well understood. And what I see here is that no matter how weak the interaction, if we have an attractive interaction, usually coming from the exchange of phonons or something else, then we find the superconducting state. We find that the superconducting state is the absolutely natural ground state of any good metal, unless something else happens before, such as it becomes magnetic, becomes charge density wave order, becomes a mod insulator or something of that sort that would prevent this here to take place. So now let's play what would happen if we were to look at a non-Fermi liquid. For this, we need a theory for a non-Fermi liquid. This doesn't really exist in this generality. I want to do a toy model calculation. What I want to say is let's assume that we are going away from this linear and frequency behavior here. And we're just saying, let there be some more singular power, which I characterize by some exponent gamma which makes this scattering rate that comes from the self-energy more singular. I'm thinking here in terms of the imaginary axis, you can easily trans analytically continuate this to the real axis. So I have some singular power in my self-energy, and now I want to do the exact same calculation again, something that was done in the mid and late 90s uh, when the high TC group rates came about. So I somewhat the exact same diagram. I have the same geometric series, I have some pairing interaction, and I need to do this integral, but now I take the new self-energy, not the old self-energy. I do my integrations. I assume the self-energy to be momentum independent, so I can do the same integration here, and I basically left over with one additional integral. And you see, at small frequencies and gamma positive, this is the dominating, dominating term at low energies. And uh, so therefore I can throw away this term because it's subleading. And now the integral becomes convergent at the lower limit. And that's important. The pair susceptibility of this object is not divergent anymore. The reason being that these quasi particles are ill-defined and therefore the sharpness of the Cooper instability has disappeared. So what we find is that this susceptibility here is a finite value. And of course, now I can insert it in here and check when do I get a pole. But now you see, I need to have a critical value of the interaction, basically such that times this finite value, I reach one. 
And only when the coupling constant is larger than that critical value would I get superconductivity. So it means if this here was all there is, that superconductivity in a non-fermi liquid should be the exception, just like, say, ferromagnetism is the exception. Of course, ferromagnetism is allowed to exist, but the, the interaction of the problem always needs to reach the stoner instability criterion, a critical value for the interaction, and therefore you have quite a few, have rather few ferromagnets that are itinerant, and you have a lot more superconductors. So, Bardeen wrote a paper uh, that he, where he explained why superconductivity in sodium doesn't occur. Nobody would come up with the idea to write a paper why ferromagnetism in sodium doesn't occur. Well, the answer is simple. There's no stoner criterion obeyed. So, that if this here was all there is, then we would conclude that at a critical point, there shouldn't be, where we have such a strong scattering, these power laws that have been observed, there shouldn't be superconductivity. It should be when we are going away from the critical point that we recover the Fermi liquid, and as you can see from transport properties and so forth, and then there should be superconductivity. So all what I've told you makes no sense. And there's, of course, one important assumption that I've made here, namely, I assumed that the interaction here is on the time scale of the dynamics of the scattering process instantaneous. So I pretended it to be basically a constant, not a frequency dependent object. And this is precisely the answer to the problem. And uh, so historically, there were indeed two very, very different answers given to this problem. Let me give you the first one, and then we will talk about the second one, which is the more exotic one in a second. So the the theoretical concept of dealing with this one uh, that goes back to Damson and uh, Chubukov, Abanov and Finkelstein and a number of others uh, is the following. So if you have some fermions, psi dagger psi, some fermion bilinear density, spin density, you name it, that couples to some boson and the boson becomes critical and you sum up diagrams in one way or another, then if you work hard, you can indeed get such singular self-energies, the ones that we just discussed. But it always, and at the same time, you find that the pairing interaction of this critical state is no longer frequency independent, but is much more singular. So the same singular scattering that destroys quasiparticles particles makes the pairing interaction a lot more singular. We will see an example for this behavior. And it's basically this, and, and, and the, the funny thing is, the exponent that you see in these two terms are, is the same. It's not just some exponent, it's always the same exponent. And therefore, what is basically being made up by uh, uh, the, so the loss of coherence of the carriers is being made up by being interacting much more strongly in some way. And we will see how this evolves. So this gives rise to something that is a, a generalization of the Cooper instability in a critical system. And if you analyze this problem, you find that with this much more singular interaction, you get even higher TCs than the ones that you would get with the good old fashioned uh, Cooper logarithm. Uh, and, uh, and that's ultimately I, in our understanding today why TC is largest at the critical point. But you need to be careful and take these singularities into account. Now, historically, and over the years, there was a completely different interpretation of uh, basically pairing in a critical state. And this is an interpretation that I never really understood and therefore spent recently some time on. The statement goes like this, and I will give you a couple of more slides on it as we move on. Critical systems can be described by um, a mapping between the quantum field theory that we know and love, that lives in space and time because of dynamics, and it, this can be mapped onto Einstein's general relativity problems in one extra dimension. So therefore, if you have d space dimension, we go not in d plus one time, but the d plus two, there's an extra space dimension. And there's some curvature to space, and the curvature lives in a space that goes under the name of ADS, which stands for anti sitter. That's a gravitational space with a negative cosmological constant. Now, this sounds to me like complete incomprehensible uh, discussion. I never understood this, uh, even though I've heard talks about this from wonderfully smart people over the years. 
But then the logic is, the statements is, and these are just the words, that the, uh, the gravity endows the system with the scale invariance of the critical state. And then, for example, a superconductor would be a good old-fashioned Ginzburg-Landau expansion in that gravitational space. This is a theory put forward by the late Steve Gupser, a string theorist, and also Sean Hartnell, Herzog, and Horowitz, also string theorists, uh, in now, uh, whatever, 14 years ago. Now, what I will show, in, uh, you can complain about both of these, these approaches, right? Here, there are lots of assumptions made on diagrams that you're summing up that may not be all that controlled. This year is a calculation that on a mathematical level you can perform. I just don't understand why I should be doing this and why there is a mapping to this gravitational problem. And what I want to discuss to you is that uh, we found a way recently to start from a specific model that has all this physics here and where we were able to demonstrate this holographic duality in explicitly step-by-step -step calculation, we can see how the gravity description in the problem emerges, which is, I think, quite entertaining uh, as uh, as such. So let me just skip through. Well, maybe I have to do this. So there is there is a historical analogous calculation, if you want so. Namely, if you start from the Bardeen-Cooper-Schrieffer theory of superconductivity, the Ginzburg-Landau theory, where you have, say, one scalar order parameter of the problem, was derived by Lev Korkov in the late 50s. And he explained to us, basically, that the scalar field of the Ginzburg-Landau theory is uh, essentially given by the anomalous Green's function of, uh, the, um, of the superconducting problem. So just to remind us what we are talking about here is this anomalous Green's function is a normal time ordered or retarded, whatever you wish to use, Green's function, where we have two annihilation operators or two creation operators, which tells us something about Cooper pairs, something that we've seen in the off diagonal long range order discussion uh, in just a second ago. And this depends on two space and two time coordinates, this object. And it's convenient to go to the center of gravity for time and space and the relative coordinates and do Fourier transformation with respect to these relative coordinates, so the differences of these two time points or space points. And this is what we need to look at when we have inhomogeneous systems or non-equilibrium dynamics, and it depends on the total position or time. And the internal structure, say, of the pair is given by the relative time. What is, is this a D wave or is this an S wave? Is this um, something where we have internal resonances in the, in the pair, or is this a basically structuralist uh, object? What we want to do is we want to do the same to start from some many-body Hamiltonian and to derive this uh, scalar field, but now for the corresponding gravitational formulation of the problem. So a few more words on this holographic story. So what we all are familiar with, to some extent, is quantum field theory. Uh, we have position and space, we have some quantum field that lives in it in d plus one uh, dimension. That's how we deal with, we can do imaginary time or real time, and these are all things that we have to learn hard, but in the end of the day, this is something that is established. Now I'm looking at this problem from the side and then I add an extra dimension, and that's what these holographers do. And there's curvature in this extra dimension, and the words that are being used, and this goes back to wonderful work by Juan Maldacena, Gupsa, Klebanov, Polyakov, and Ed Witten, here in the late 90s, uh, and then was applied to the condensed matter concept by a number of, of smart people thereafter. Here we have curvature in this direction, and the interpretation that's been given is that we have essentially, uh, this is where we live on this boundary of the problem, and then the this is a renormalization group flow, or this is an effective energy scale that probes the system at certain excitation energies, and that typically stops at the at uh, if there is some temperature as one over t. So if the t is zero, this goes up to infinity. And how stops this? If you had a gravitational theory, well, you put a black hole there because then you can't uh, advance from there anymore, at least in finite times. So at, from an observer point of view, that's far away. So so this is um, these are all words at the moment. Uh, we want to fill uh, these words. At least for me, these were words, of course, for the holographic community and the string theory community, they knew exactly what they were talking about. Um, and we want to see how we can understand this as condensed metaphysicists. So, and uh, there is then um, uh, 
interesting properties, how you have to deal with this when you put, for example, a charged field that describes the Cooper pair in this problem. Uh, and uh, the analysis of a ginsburg landau theory in this gravitational background is a little bit different. The transition temperatures take place not when the mass of the problem uh, is changes sign, but uh, when it reaches a certain critical threshold that goes back to Brighton, Lohner, and Friedman uh, long ago in the, the gravitational literature. Uh, we will get back to this in a sense. So first, we need to learn a little bit how such an anti-decitter space looks like. Such an anti-decitter space is an is an hyperbolic space, if you want. So, and in fact, if I go to imaginary time. I can write down that this enter the zitter space is nothing else but a hyperboloid. So this area, this surface here, that is the solution of basically these equations in X, Y, Z space. And um, well, this is at least something we can look at and we, we don't need to be overly impressed by. There's an efficient parametrization of, these, of this condition in terms of two variables. One will be, play the role of imaginary time and the other one will be an extra dimension, this holographic variable. I'm just repeating to you some mathematical statements. This has nothing to do as of now with physics. It's just so we are getting on the same page. So in this, if you look in this parameterization at the geodesics, so the shortest distances between two points, then they're actually becoming semicircles in this coordinate system. And the metric in this coordinate system is given um, by these by this uh, line element here, which where you see from this coefficient that this is obviously not a flat space description. In this parametrization, we can cover this hyperboloid in this funny way. This is not preserving the rotational symmetry as, say, x1 is differently parameterized from x2 and x3. This is not overly surprising. So this is a simple mathematical uh, summary of holographic space. None of you could, you know, in this couple of minutes follow all of this. But every one of you has the capacity to just sit down and for about 10 minutes to understand all of it. There's nothing that is overly mysterious or that's beyond us. So what we have, therefore, is a metric that looks like this. This is our entire desitter space. Now I'm going and adding a couple of space dimension in addition to time. Uh, and then the metric changes accordingly. So where this was originally only the timeline part, there's now also space part. And if I have... Um, a ginsburg landau theory in this funny space. I just want to summarize, if I insert all of this, calculate the determinant of the matrix and so forth and so on, perform Fourier transform with respect to momenta, position, and, and time, then I'm getting an expression that looks like this. You don't need to memorize it, but you need to appreciate that this is something that we can write down without losing all, a whole lot of sweat. Right? There are derivatives in this funny extra coordinates and there are different dependencies. We just want to memorize if I can derive this, what I have derived in fact is the action in a gravitational space, right? Or I can at least with good conscious call it like this. We can also look at this action a little bit further just to get some, some exercise done. And we look at the saddle point of this action. This gives us a differential equation which is nothing else but the Klein-Gordon equation in, in this enter to zitter space, a d plus two, there should be a two here. And um, well, it looks like a different equation one can solve uh, for given momentum and frequencies according to this new additional variable. And we just keep in mind that this is something we want to do. So the problem that now we go back after this detour into say a little bit of general relativity in funny enter to zitter spaces, we look at toy models where we can maybe learn something. And the model that I want to discuss is um, the simplest model that gives me a non-fermi liquid that I know of, which is the suchtiv yekitaev model, a model that was much discussed during the last five, six years um, uh, because of uh, some recent talk that provoked some discussion by Alexei Tikitaev. The model itself goes back to, to the uh, early 90s with uh, wonderful work follow up also by Antoine Roche and Olivier Pacolet and Subir Satchdev in 2000. So what are we having? We have no kinetic energy. We have some chemical potential of fermions and we have an interaction here and this interaction is random. Uh, the interaction is random and every lattice site or every flavor index that we can come up with interact with every other flavor index in any possible combination. Even if they are far apart in some lattice version of this, 
often one thinks of, say, a quantum dot where there are many, many internal degrees of freedom. What we understand with the IJKL is it's our personal interpretation. And then we have a mean squared value that I call u. To solve this problem is well established how you do this when this number n of degrees of freedom is very large. In this limit, you can write down a collective quantum field theory. But you don't do this for the fermion operators, but you do this for the Green's functions of the operator. That's the beauty. You can write down a field theory that is and they're very, very conveniently done in these objects that depends on two objects, two times in this specific case. So it's basically an integral where you integrate over Green's function and self-energies. And if you get the saddle point of this one, because of the action depends on n only through one overall coefficient. So you can do saddle point mean field calculations at large n, then you basically get very simple equations. This is something like this diagram self-consistently calculated and the Dyson equation. Now these two coupled equations, you can all solve in about 20 minutes. You just make an ansatz, a power law form, insert it, fully transform, and find that at low energies, this is a solution of the problem with a fractional exponent one quarter entering here. So there's power law behavior of the Green's function of the fermions, and it basically looks like this. So we don't have a delta function like what we have in a Fermi liquid. Instead, we have a branch cut with a funny power law behavior. And uh, what, when I saw this picture in one talk given in Karlsruhe by uh, a visitor, I asked myself, so what would happen if I could make such a non-Fermi liquid state superconducting? And that's really what, what uh, we will be focusing on. Before I get there, I need to inform you about an interesting property of this model. This solution that I've written down here, where we said the self-energy is so important and singular, I can even forget about it compared to the leading, say, I omega term after Fourier transformation. So, in the, so when I drop this derivative here, then this is the low energy solution. And, but this is only of infinitely many solutions, it turns out. You can reparameterize time by an arbitrary function and you can use f instead of tau. And it's still, if this is a mono monotonous function, this is still a solution of the problem uh, for any function f of tau. So there's actually an infinity of solutions. And if you look um, which one is the right one, you need to include the high energy physics of the problem. And there, therefore, you need to pay a little bit of energy for uh, any function of f that you use here. And uh, hence, uh, there is an effective action for fluctuations of reparameterizations. Now, this sounds all complicated, but what is interesting about it is that this effective that you get characterized by some third and second and first derivatives in this funny combination happens to be the gravitational theory for this funny antithesitor space, if you solve Einstein's theory of gravity, or more precisely, a mod version of it, um, so-called Jacques Teitelbaum gravity, in this antithesitor space too. So there is, it was already in, uh, observed that the purely normal state behavior of this problem probably has something to do with gravity. But it wasn't sure how this mapping really should occur. Um, because uh, this was more of a property of the, the underlying conformal or uh, in, this is a conformal transformation in one dimension, right? Good. So now we want to look at our model. Uh, our model is a model of interacting electrons with phonons because I want to make the system superconducting. It doesn't have to be phonons. I can take spin fluctuations and so forth. Phonons just ended up being very, very easy. And this is a calculation we did with Ilya Estalis in about 2019. So we have electrons, phonons with some Einstein modes, uh, and we have a random interaction that couples electrons to phonons. And you always have to take this funny randomness into account in order to uh, make these calculations controlled in some large n limit. And what we did here is we need to think a little bit about the distribution functions of those, those random numbers. And I don't need to go into too much detail. Important is actually only that we find that we know quite well um, how to make the distribution function so that the system is not superconducting because individual realizations break time reversal symmetry and therefore kill pairing, or how we can make it so that we get superconductivity out of the problem. And we found superconductivity in this little toy model. 
The formulation is very much the same than what we said earlier. You have a Green's function and self energies as collective variables, but we also have the Green's function that Gorkov introduced with two creation or two annihilation operators and corresponding self energies as collective fields. And of course, for the bosons, the phonons themselves, we have to do the same. And then we have a long action with lots of variables. And we can find uh, what is the stationary point. Statement number one is the saddle point of the problem, the mean field theory of this problem, is exactly the same than the set of equations that uh, Gerasim Eliasberg wrote down to solve strong coupling superconductors. The nature of the solution is very different because we get quantum critical normal states, uh, but we have now uh, what we can use the same set of equations for these non fermi liquid normal states uh, to analyze the corresponding superconducting states. So this is just self energies renormalized by bosons. We get an anomalous and a normal self energy, and the phonon self energy gets also renormalized. We can analyze this, and we find all what's important about this slide is we find at low temperatures, as a function of the coupling constant strength of the problem. At low temperatures, we find these funny power laws again. They are, take slightly different values, but again, we find branch cut singularities for the fermions and now also for the bosons. And they are actually characterized by the same exponents because the Landau damping, the fractional Landau damping that is provided by the dynamical of the fermions dominates the bosons and the bosons get always quantum critical at low temperatures. So my interpretation is more like this. We Here we have interacting electrons and bosons, and they can be separated when we are maybe at high temperatures. At low temperatures, this is one compact soup characterized by the same exponents, but it doesn't really make much difference to distinguish. This is a phonon, this is an electron. It's a very strongly interacting soup. This is a toy model. It's very simple, but we can solve it rigorously, and that's why we get some insights into this. We can find superconductivity. Um, as a function of the coupling constant, we can talk a lot about this. This is what I'd mentioned to you earlier. The uh, superconductivity is now not exponentially small, but only power law small, which is one interpretation why TC is largest when you're quantum critical. We can add pair breaking to the system and can destroy superconductivity and add this transition temperature. The superconductivity always behaves like in this essential singularity type of behavior that you see here. And when I saw this, and we found this with a master student here a um, couple of years ago, then I remembered that I had seen very different, similar behavior for holographic superconductivity in the enter to sitter space too. So there was some reason to believe that what we found here is actually identical to what in some way to the gravitational description. And this will be the last uh, discussion of this, of this talk. If I can now linearize these, the Eliasberg equations, I get the, a self-consistent equation for the, uh, for the superconducting gap function, if you want, so as a function of energy. This will be an energy-dependent function. Everything is critical. I cannot assume anything to be constants. And this has a very funny form. Here we see the self-energy, and here we see the more singular pairing interaction. That's precisely what I told you earlier that more singular pairing interaction can offset the lack of coherency of a self-energy that becomes singular. All of this can be seen in this little toy model. And it is something that was observed in a large number of papers, not just in such a toy model, but in many, many interesting quantum critical metals, antiferromagnetic gauge field induced composite fermion, pneumatic fluctuations, uh, uh, spin liquids and so forth. We always found very similar gap equation, just the exponent were different values. They typically are between one and two. Now, what is interesting is I can take this integral equation and at least in some limit, I can rewrite it in a few steps of algebra. I can rewrite it as a differential equation. And if I had done you know, a blackboard presentation, I would have done this presentation, but of course it would have taken a quarter of the lecture. You can find a second order differential equation that also fulfills this integral equation. And of course, we always like much more to solve differential equations. And with a little bit of algebra, namely introducing a new variable that is one over the frequency, I can see and adding some power laws up front, 
I can find a differential equation for a new function psi based out of this good old fashioned self energy sigma or phi, big phi. And, and this gives me an equation that is indeed the uh, Klein Gordon equation, at least for omega and q equal zero, that we have seen earlier. So we see the mathematics of uh, the uh, of this uh, Eliasberg equations is actually identical to the mathematics in anti-Tacitus space in a gravitational space. We're not quite there yet because we have only one variable, which is the Fourier transform of the relative time. We also need to look at the absolute time and at the total momentum of the problem for general problems. But uh, here we have only absolute time, which is because of the simplicity of the model. And but we see that we can already recover a pseudo gravitational description. We have uh, then went to say two time variables, did Fourier transformation with respect to relative time, which we've just discussed, and absolute time, as we dis discussed earlier and expanded the action of this problem to quadratic order. There are all kinds of diagrams that we recover. This is our particle-particle diagram. That's the one that gives us this weakened singularity uh, of a Cooper instability. This gives us the strongest singularity of the pairing interaction. This is my boson propagator of the normal state. All this can be diagrammatically understood. And we can now uh, use a scalar field representation uh, of this anomalous Green's function with some power loss motivated by what we've just seen. And we're almost getting, if I insert all of this, we're almost getting a gravitational action. There are a couple of minus signs wrong. This is now a more or less a technical detail that we shouldn't dwell on too much. But uh, what we need to do is we need to take instead of uh, these variables that I've just discussed, average over the much earlier discussed geodesics, and uh, then we find what goes under the name of a Radon transformation. So we need to actually identify this field as an geodesics averaged a quantity, which is determined by a midpoint and a radius. And with this one technical trick, which I trust me is not all that important, we can find a representation of our anomalous Green's function in terms of a scalar function that lives in an extra dimension. And the action of this problem is indeed the one that we would get for a holographic space in Antarctica space too. So what we've learned here is that this gravitational formulation of critical theory is something that has real structure and can be derived in a condensed matter context. How is the total time that would enter non-equilibrium dynamics? And that is the relative, is the inverse frequency of the relative times. And in this formulation, the, um, this looks like a gravitational space if and only if the normal state is quantum critical because all of this power law behavior is only possible because our normal state is characterized by these quantum critical exponents. We can now understand all the individual terms. Maybe this is too technical. But you can also do something else. The calculation so far was done at finite temperatures. I can do the exact same calculation at zero temperature, and it gets even more beautiful. Now the mapping, which goes along in very much the same way, is not onto a metric in enter to space, but in a metric in enter to space with a black hole right given by the temperature of the system. Uh, so therefore, the, the fact that basically uh, finer temperatures cuts off energies um, and uh, stops RG flow, if you wish. So it's indeed encoded in this problem by having a black hole in the problem. If you take this equation, take its saddle point, we recover the good old fashioned Eliasberg equations. So with this, I can basically finish and tell you that um, we can maybe uh, look at superconductors by critical bosons. And we found a model, this SYK model, that is in fact identical and has the same physics of this model. And at the same time, that can be shown to be mathematically identical to these holographic superconductors in gravitational spaces. And hence, what we therefore strongly argue is that these two alternative explanations for quantum critical, quantum critical superconductor are in fact the same. They're just formulated mathematically in a very different way. And for any given problem, one 
or the other is mathematically much more efficient. In the meantime, we have extended this to finite dimensional systems, to pairing in Dirac systems, pneumatic superconductivity, and so forth. And you find always holographic descriptions if you have these quantum critical pairing states. And uh, particularly when you want to look at dynamics, non-equilibrium excitations, and so forth, your holographic superconductor description is clearly an easier one, just like that for some systems, the Ginzburg-Landau theory is an easier formulation than the BCS theory. With this, I thank you for your attention. Jack. Now it's time for questions. So, yeah, it's, it's going wrong because uh, the speakers. Uh, can you no. show the model again in your transparency? Yes, of course. The action. Oh, someone online. <laughs> the model or the action? The Hamiltonian or the action? Uh, action. You have coupling. You have two coupling constant, right? I have one coupling constant. Uh, Let me show you the Hamiltonian again. It's a very simple problem. I mean, the this one with uh, phonon. Yeah, 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 this one. Yeah, yeah. This. So there's. this is just the bare phonon uh, energy or frequency. And this is, is only, and this has one mean value. So this is, this is these are the coupling constants. Right. And, and, and what you have real part in the imaginary part. Oh, right? yeah. Exactly. In this sense, we have two coupling constants. Yeah, you're quite right. So, what we did is we say um, uh, the real and the imaginary part don't have to have the same distribution functions. Um, this was turned out to be important because if this coupling constant is purely imaginary, um, uh, it's, it's complex, sorry, it's arbitrarily complex. So, for given K, it is Gaussian uh, unitary ensemble, then we don't get superconductivity. And if it's purely real, we do get superconductivity. And in both cases, we have only one coupling constant. But um, then you can introduce this, what we call alpha, which basically interpolates between purely complex and purely real with giving real and imaginary part different uh, di distribution widths. Yes. So in general, the Hamiltonian is not Hermitian. It is Hermitian, perfectly Hermitian. Uh, why? I'm sorry. Uh, because in Gij. Uh, so if I take the comp we always assume, of course, that G I J star is G J I. Mm -hmm. So this is Hermitian operator by all means. You you can have a complex coupling constant. You just have to have another term that is complex conjugated of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So so there's a. A lot of uh, questions from the professor. So, I think general is needed. Oh, okay. So, can you see me? Um, so, following up these questions um, on the actual photo of coupling. So, yes. So, uh, we need a random natural form of coupling to get a super right? Mm hmm. And I'm wondering why. Um, one of the consider um, is uh, you know, CS by the electron photo, regular one, so you won't get the uh, superconductivity. Well, one more time if I take G to be uh, real, I get superconductivity, right? Yeah. Oh, you, I didn't quite understand the question, to be very honest, but this okay. is just. Um, my question is, uh, why do you consider a random electron photon? Yeah. Right. Um, so this goes, of course, back to the physics of the SYK model itself, right? Which you also always consider to be a model of random interactions. The reason is probably the honest answer is because we are very, very desperate creatures. So. Uh, we cannot, this is a model that we can solve. Um, we can solve it rigorously, um, uh, but uh, we uh, we have in mind probably that the system, you need, if, if the system wasn't random, it would just become order in some trivial way. And with the randomness, you basically want to introduce so much frustration in the system that you keep these quantum critical states alive to lowest temperatures. It's a dirty trick that allows you to do calculations rigorously, 
And it is clearly something that we would like to avoid. But at this point, um, we can only do rigorous calculation um, in the context where we have these interactions random. So this is, at the moment, in my view, primarily an expression of our, say, um, of our desperation that those are the models we, we know how to solve these days. Okay, Matthew, uh, just a yeah. technical question. So when you get the superconductivity, you solve the BCF scan equation. Uh-huh. Self-consistency, right? Yep. Did you do RG? You, you can do the same. You get RG equations. So basically, um, yes. So, so I wouldn't call this a BCS gap equation because this uh, the gap is a strongly frequency dependent object. It's more like the Elyashbeck equation, but that's uh, it's a, maybe a technical detail. Uh, this equation, as I told you, you can write down as a differential equation. And I can now basically construct phi divided by the derivative of phi as my effective coupling constant. And then I find an RG equation that um, is basically a generalization of the Cooper instability in a renormalization group language. So this differential equation here, you can also derive using RG arguments. Um, and, uh, and it is basically your flow equation. Uh, which makes perfect sense because that's the interpretation, right? That's the holographic differential equation. Essentially, it's a renormalization group equation. Uh, I didn't discuss this aspect here. I focused on the, the gravitational aspect because, well, it's just, um, in, to some extent, uh, the, say, the more, more contemporary discussion that we had in the community, but you can also write this as a renormalization group equation. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, please go, go in front. There's another question from the local audience. Right. This microphone is here. Oh, uh, can you hear me? I can, yes. Uh, so I have a, uh, I have a question about events and solders. As you already mentioned, if the solder is for an experiment, it's actually it's tool for experiment. Is the solution is actually right? But do you have, do you think there might be some connection to the, I mean, you saw that in the real system? I, I'm sorry, I couldn't understand it. Maybe somebody could repeat it. Oh, you, you want to yeah, 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 yeah. So can you hear me more clearly now? No, it's better. No, it's much better. Oh, I see, I see. So, yeah, as you mentioned before, I think the crash disorder here is used to and you solve the uh, equation exactly, right? But yes, I think there's just some maybe uh, connection to the disorder in real material or? Yes, of course there is. I mean, um, <clears throat> for example, what you can do is you can take multiple of those dots, right? Of those SYK dots and couple them and you couple them with a random kinetic energy again. And then you find, um, for example, you can calculate the superfluid stiffness. We know the superfluid stiffness of a superconductor is very much um, affected by, by disorder, even if TC is not. Uh, and you, what you find, um, if you, you can then look at fermi-liquid and non-fermi-liquid regimes, and you find uh, that lots of things that we know from disorder, real disorder effects to matter can be seen in these calculations. Um, it's just not the aspect I was focusing right now on, but you're quite right. If you have really disordered systems, you can use these calculations, of course, to model them. My claim is, and we will see whether the claim is true. My claim is that even if we have translation invariant systems, some of the logic that we've used here can is probably more general than the realm within which we have uh, derived things. Um, and... Um, if maybe as techniques advance, we might actually, for example, some of those holographic derivations, be able to do them even without uh, needing to resort to disorder. But yes, you're right. We find lots of properties of disordered superconductors from those calculations. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Any other questions? Uh, so maybe I can ask one final question if I am allowed. Uh, so, so, so far, this is considered some kind of zero dimension yes. superconductors, right? So, 
if I want to understand my scenario effect or other properties from that perspective, yes. should, how should I do in this model? Yeah. So the models that we looked at, I didn't uh, just out of time reason, other models that we looked at are, for example, problems like this. This is a Dirac system. It lives in a D-dimensional space. And, uh, and on each lattice site, we give the problem additional flavor indices. And, uh, and then we have on each lattice site these random interactions, but they are the same for every lattice site. So this is arguably a crazy but well-controlled generalization that goes back here to the Berkeley group. They used our model and put it on a lattice, on a, in this case, on a Dirac lattice. And they found for this Dirac lattice now real spatial structure translation invariant because each realization is the same for all lattice points. You're basically averaging over a bunch of models, if you want so. And we managed to uh, write for this problem uh, the same holographic mapping, but now we are living in ADS4 if this is a two dimensional problem. And now we can actually calculate Meissner effects and stiffnesses, and we find, for example, that the, stiff, that the TCs of these superconductors are very large, but the stiffnesses are not very large. They're actually rather fragile superconductors. Here we have a model that goes back to Estalis, uh, Guo, Patel, and such. They also used our model, but put it on a lattice with a family surface. Uh, we did this calculation too, and we find um, that now we find holographic uh, description in ADS2 cross R2, with basically the same holographic uh, version that we had just established for the SYK model. But again, in this model, we can derive now superfluid stiffnesses, uh, penetration depths, and so forth. And again, we find that they are actually rather, sub that this is fragile superconductivity with a large TC. But so the model I presented to you does not have the concept of a, of a, of a penetration depth. You're absolutely right. But we have in the meantime generalized this approach to other models that make a little bit more sense, can be formulated in finite dimensions, and uh, hence have all these properties that we want to understand for superconductors. Okay. okay. Thank you very much for the very interesting talk. So thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you.